All righty, I guess we'll get it going here. Um, so this week we're going to cover some a few more things from statistics, and uh, that's the big part we're going to do in class this week. Um, it's so next week there'll be a couple more video pieces going up, um, just for the probability stuff that I normally would do in class when I add a couple little bit of the online material. And then next next Saturday morning will be a three hour test. Um, I'll have the review out for it this week as well. It should be out, but for some reason it's not on there. So I'll go back and dig it up. Test will be almost identical to that. It's obviously different problems, um, but same basic premise. You'll have three hours to do it, and then you'll have another half an hour to upload it after that. Um, I will be, I'll have my machine on or whatever here, but I'm not gonna sit here and stare at it the whole time. Um, I think I'll just have some kind of a Zoom. No, actually I won't, I'll just have the email up. I guess that's what I'll do. So I will have the email up, I'll be checking in and seeing if there's anything that you need uh, on the test, but it's pretty straightforward, I think, especially if you did the review. Uh, there's an answer key for the review as well, so I'll get put up later today. Um, the test will cover financial stuff and the statistics that we've talked about, including what we talked about today. Uh, and then we'll, um, during this next week course, we'll start learning probability, but that won't be on this test at all. Anyway, so today we are going to be, as I say, going through some more statistics stuff, like so. And here we go. So, the big news is, the big news is, what do you do if you have a bunch of numbers, okay? So that's, that's key, and it's not very hard, because this is what everybody does. If this were, I don't know your scores on a test, you're not very good, but uh, let's see here, that would be, yeah, that'll work, I guess, sure. Okay, if those were your scores on a test, yeah, that's not too good. But if these are your scores on your test, so it's the first thing that you do, first thing anybody does when they see a list of numbers, almost in, instinctively, let's find the average, okay? Uh, which we in statistics refer to as the mean. And of course, you do that by you add them up and you divide by the number of them. So I'm going to show you this, okay? Because those of you that go on to statistics will see this a ton and it freaks you out the first time you see it because you've never seen it written like this before. So we say X bar, that's how you say the X bar. That's always the sample average. And so we've talked about samples a little bit. That is the idea that you take a sample from a population. Um, so you want to study how this drug or that drug works on whatever, whether it's corona, whether it's warts, whatever, whatever it is. And you find people obviously with that issue and you select them randomly. You don't pick, you know, hey, I'm gonna get the guy with the worst case of this, see if I can fix it. I'll get people with a light case of it. I get random selections. And so we take the average of that sample. Okay, so we will never find. Uh, some books will write it like this. This is how you write it. This is called, this is the Greek letter mu. That's how you say it. It's the population average. No one ever will actually compute the population average because if you did, there's no reason to do statistics. The whole point of doing statistics is to find out an unknown or get an idea of an unknown. Okay? I don't know what the average height of all women in America is. Okay. I don't know what the average wingspan of a monarch butterfly is uh, only the good lord knows that uh, so because i cannot physically do that maybe it's to um, cost too much money um, maybe it'd be too hard to do i take a representative sample of them okay and i figure it out from there so we'll only ever compute this guy okay and what we'll do with this is we'll try to make a statement about this unknown value that's how statistics works that is i don't know the average wingspan of this butterfly. So I go out and select, you know, a thousand of them or whatever, and I measure them and I go, hmm, all right. So the sample average is this. What are you what are you saying by that? That the population average is most likely somewhere in that ballpark as well. Uh, that's not enough. We're gonna have to do more than that. But again, that's why sample averages. And so it's the same thing that you've done forever, except in statistics we write it like this. And not to freak you out or anything, just because this is shorthand for saying, let's add them all up. Whenever you see the Greek letter sigma, it just means some, somewhat. Well, the X's, well, what do you mean the X's? Well, there's 
one X, two X, three X's, that's right. And so X sub I is like saying X is his first name and then I is kind of his last name. So the first X, second X, third X, fourth X, however many, up to N of them, okay? So in our case up here, there are uh, five of them. So in our case, it'd be from one to five and then we divide by five. Okay, this is the shorthand notation for writing it. And I, I introduce it in this class because it's a lot easier. You're not expected to memorize it right now. You're not freaked out by it when you see it in 243. No one's gonna get all excited about it and freak out. So if I add these up, I get uh, it's 30, 60, 80, 130, 130 divided by five, of course, is 26, I believe. So the average is 26, yay. And so there's nothing new or different about that. No one's shocked by that, I don't think. Um, something you've done since, I don't know, third grade or whenever. Mrs. So-and-so said, let's find the average of this or that. And you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, not very hard to do, okay. Uh, another term that you've seen from the past, a little blast from the past is the idea of a mode. And that's of course the most frequently occurring number. And of course, that's a big deal in our respects because we look at most frequently occurring number, obviously it must be a big deal. That's what everybody's scoring or we scored a bunch of these, okay? That frequently is something that's gonna be a big deal to us um, in terms of, not necessarily in a statistics class, but in a real life situation. Well, I got a lot of people that are scoring this grade or they're, you know, they're really low grades or something or maybe high grades. So maybe I wanna do something about that, okay? Um, yeah, so sample averages and then modes. And then another one that's come to mind over the years, people always ask about where does this one come in? Well, of course, this is the middle number. Oops, middle number. And, you know, maybe you had Mrs. So-and-so for math, and I can't do it on the computer because I can't show you, but it, maybe she told you to put one hand here and one hand here, and I'm like, oh, no, and then move your hands here and here, and then eventually you end up with the middle number, right? I don't know if that's how your teacher taught you how to do it. Um, I've seen people do that. That's cool. My teacher always just said, hey, there's five of them. Find the middle guy. That's the third one. I don't know. It was like we were supposed to just figure that out. But there it is. That's the middle number. And, and so what does that do for us? Well, this middle number is not affected by weirdos, uh, statistical freaks, if you will. Statistical, I can't spell today. Freaks, and we call we call those guys outliers. Okay, um, if you come back up here and look, none of these numbers stand out from a crowd. But if I put five hundred right here, what's the middle number? The middle number is still twenty. Okay, but the average has changed a lot now because now it adds up to five eighty. Right divided by five, so that's 116, I think, is the average. Well, good grief, that's nowhere near, quote unquote, the middle of our five numbers, 116 is. It's right in here somewhere. Uh, it is the balance point, if you will, but it's not at all um, the middle of our set. So, you know, that's something to think about. The statistical average, the average is where you would balance it if these people all weighed the same, okay? And their actual numbers were how far they're sitting away from the fulcrum if they were all teeter-tottering. So, oops, oh, I'm sorry, we had a 10. Oh, we had 220s, I'm sorry. So if the 10 guy, he was way over here, that they all weigh the same, if you will. Um, or, I'm sorry, that's his weight. But you can think of it as they're teeter-tottering here. So there's 10, there's 220 guys here like this, and then there's a 30 guy right here, okay? And when I was a kid, you know, I was the, I was the great big fat kid. So I had to be, I had to put the balance a lot closer to me <laughs> when I was teeter-tottering, okay? So this fifth, this 500 one, you'd have to put the fulcrum here at 116 to balance these guys out. And it would look kind of funny that way because this huge one over here is being balanced by these four guys, but where are they? They are way far away from that fulcrum position, okay? So the thing to remember about the average is it is greatly skewed by weirdos. This number here does not belong in this data set. That's just weird. If these were the weights of four month olds, uh, 10, 20, 30 pounders, and then a 500 pounder, that doesn't belong. That's weird. Okay. Now, 
Uh, the, but the median is not skewed by that at all. And that's why when you listen to the radio or the news, whatever, and you read about uh, the median family income, okay, or the median house price. Well, that's because if, for instance, in my little town here, St. Helens, you might find one or two houses that are, you know, I don't know, I don't think any of them are near a million dollars, but probably $500,000 house. But let's say someone moved to town, Bill Gates moves to town, I don't know why he would do that, and he builds himself a $10 million house here. If we randomly selected some houses, you'd see a lot that are in the low 200, mid 200s, and then some in the 100,000. And then if you got bills in there, all of a sudden the average house price in St. Helens might be somewhere in the neighborhood of $800,000. Well, that's nowhere near where the middle of our house range is. Instead, if you listed them out in line and found the middle one, the, av the median house price, it's not affected by the upper ones or the lower ones. I remember reading an article some years ago about um, there was one house in Lake Oswego that was, had been a rental for years and it was um, somehow it was, somehow it was, I don't remember how the deal was anyways, it's kind of a ratty place. It must've been the only one in, Saint, in Lake Oswego that was like that. And if you'd have taken that house and probably, it's still probably a $200,000 house back then or 300,000, I don't remember. And you would put it together with all the other houses in Lake Oswego, some down the lake, some up on the hills there and stuff, and you'd put them in line. That one also would stand out. It would really drag the property prices down in Lake Oswego uh, from an average standpoint. But from a median standpoint, it wouldn't have affected it at all because the median is just the middle number, okay? And so all three of these guys, the mean, the median, and the mode, all three of them are just ways to describe the middle of a data set. That is, it's ways to tell me, you know, hey, what is the uh, what is the middle or what's the average person doing here? Okay, um, they are what are called measures of central tendency. That's what the big kids call it, okay? Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to hone in on, the, well, the middle of the population. If you've ever been in a class where the teacher teaches to the two smartest kids in a class and the rest of you are going, uh, that's not fun. And if the teacher's teaching to the, the slowest two kids in a class, ah, that's not a lot of fun either. Why is that? Because if you got it and you had it for like, I don't know, a week, and they're still, well, now we're gonna go over this again today. And you're like, okay, let's move up, pick up the pace, let's go. It, or if you're sitting there and they're talking, and I've done a few of these back in my master's degree, there was about six of us in the class this one time. And this one professor, all she did was talk to this one guy and he'd sit there and go, oh yeah, so it's like so-and-so's theorem. And, oh, yeah. and they had their own little side conversation. And the rest were sitting there going, you get that? I have no idea what she's doing, I don't know. And it was very awkward because you, know, you, you want to, as a teacher, hit the middle. Um, you want to, if you're selling, sh let's say shoes, you would like to hit the middle of the shoe market. You would not, unless your, unless your goal is to sell only to people with tiny little pixie feet or giant monster feet, um, you would like to have most of your shoes on the, on the shelf be, you know, your main shoe sizes that sell this, you know, I don't know, seven to nines or whatever and women sixes, I don't know, whatever normal sizes. You probably wouldn't get the 17, 18, 19 size shoes in for women. That seems a little weird. Uh, also size, I don't know, two, three, I don't know what's a small size. I don't know, something really small. That'd be odd because people come in, do you have any size, a, a size seven? No, but can I interest you in a 15? Well, that's weird. Uh, you're not gonna sell too many of those. So you gotta keep that in mind. You wanna hit that middle target there. Um, obviously that depends on what your target range is. If you if you were in Lake Oswego and you had like a Whole Foods kind of store, that kind of store, that'd be great. It might go over well there. That kind of store probably didn't go over as well in St. Helens because people aren't as sophisticated in their tastes or whatever out here, maybe perhaps, or vice versa. So just be aware of that. Um, but again, the idea of that, of all three of these is to describe where, where is the middle at, okay? Because we want to be able to hit that middle. That's kind of a big deal, okay? But again, uh, medians will be, always be listed if the data is if there's outliers in the data, okay? Again, if uh, somebody who works for his money, so let's say LeBron, moved to St. Helens, okay? Then all of a sudden, and you get him into a sample of 100 people, I wanna know what the average person in St. Helens makes yearly income. 
So you got some 35s, 40s, and 40s, and 40s, and 50s, 60s, 70s, 120s, whatever. And then you get LeBron with, you know, 80 million or whatever it is he makes a year. All of a sudden, the average is somewhere around $20 million. And you're like, uh, how did that work? Oh, because LeBron is kind of a statistical freak show when it comes to um, when it comes to salaries in our little town here. Okay, but the average, the the, the, the uh, rather the median is going to land somewhere around I don't know sixty thousand or whatever it is or fifty thousand. I don't know what it is. It's going to land somewhere right where it should be. That is, it's not affected by extremely highs or extremely lows. Okay, that's a big deal. So whenever you're approached by a data set and you see something that looks like this, and as soon as I put the, the nine here, you're like, oh, these are all small numbers. Then you jump over to 14, you're like, yeah, I'm okay, but that's, those are all fairly connected. And you're like, okay, keep going. As soon as I put the 22 there, you're like, oh, that's weird. But no, it's not that weird anymore. So you got, now you got 27 and a 30. And you're like, oh, okay, they're just really spread out numbers. And then you get one of these guys. Okay, uh, weird. Because of this weird one here, we're gonna be looking to use a median probably on this guy, okay, to describe the data set. If you saw data that looked like this, and I'm not gonna, for this time, I'm not going to make a mode, because there isn't always a mode. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, okay? If you saw this data set here, you're like, well, geez, all those numbers more or less belong together. We are going to look at this, but we're probably going to go ahead and use the mean on this one. Now, we're going to find them both for both of them, okay? We're going to compute both of them, and we're going to see what it comes out to be. But what you're going to see is on this guy, the median and the mean will be awfully close together. Mean and median will be close together because there are no outliers here there's no weirdos okay up here i'm telling you right now that if the median is let's say this is the median uh, i could count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven one two three four five one two three four five six no i don't count is it one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven one two three number 12 is i'm sorry number 12 is the median Okay, I'm telling you the average is going to be over in here somewhere. Okay, they're going to be they're going to be quite a bit further apart versus here they are going to be somewhere both right in the ballpark and in the middle. Okay, so that's we're going to look at both of them. I'll break out my calculator here and we'll go ahead and compute them. But I want you to feel confident when you know this that top one. Boom! Right now, let's use the median because you don't want to skew the data at all. So one, two, plus three, plus three. Two hundred six divided by eleven. I said, Oop, "That's not helpful." Thank you. Clear. Sorry, my bad. Two hundred six divided by eleven is eighteen point two seven. Is the mean okay? Again, where it's been pulled over toward ninety five. Notice it's not been pulled a lot toward 95 because there are a lot of numbers down here in the normal range this time, okay? If there had only been four or five numbers, then obviously it's gonna be jerked way that direction, okay? This is the exact same thing of this kid, he's been in my class, these are the scores on his homework assignments. Like, he's been consistently horrible. And then he does good on one assignment, his mom goes, well, why didn't he have an A? What, what are you talking about, crazy person? He's got 10, horrible F assignments and one good assignment. How do you expect him to have an A? Well, I feel like, no, no, that's not how it works. Also, the kid who starts crying one day, and this is typically how this goes, they're like, what's the matter? Well, I did terrible on that little assignment. Oh, okay, well, you've had an A on everything else your entire life, and by terrible, you mean you got a B. Yeah, I'm like, let's see, let's do a bunch of A's, and then one B, and probably wasn't even a low B, it's probably like an 87. What do you think your grade is? Oh, I don't know, I have an F now. No, you don't, crazy person, you still have an A, okay? Because you had an A, and then you had one little drop off, and then A forever, the average is still going to be an A. It's not gonna be affected a ton in this case, all right? Even if you had a horrible score, it wouldn't be that bad. Just a little side note, 
this week I was in a staff meeting and it comes up every so often one of my one of our staff meetings they'll they'll say something ridiculous and I'll just sit there and I used to say stuff but now I realize it's just a waste of time you might as well go hit your head on the wall or hit yourself with a hammer you just about as much good but the person in the meeting said quote make sure you're not putting in super zeros I'm like huh like yeah so apparently and this happened about 10 years ago and I remember getting in a fight with my boss about it then so I just let it go at this point um well, you should give a kid like a 50% or a 59%, even if they don't turn the assignment in. I'm like, I'm sorry, what now? Well, yeah, because see that way, if you put a zero in it, really penalizes them. I'm like, you mean the computer does math? And they don't like to hear that. But anyways, um, I almost said something, but I'm like, you know what? It doesn't do any good. I just let it go this week, okay? Um, this one here, this guy's the median, okay? If we find this one out, 50 plus 60 plus 65 plus 70 plus 75 divided by 5 is 64. The mean is just a hair short of the median. Now, why is that? Because they are so close together. Okay, there is no outliers. All right. When I have a choice, I prefer to use the mean, the mean, the average. There's a lot of good reasons for that that you wouldn't learn until you're like in a four or 500 level statistics class. But there's a lot of good, cool things we can do with the average that we can't do with the median. Okay. That said, a lot of things in life are skewed data. Again, uh, incomes, house prices, things of this nature are always going to have outliers in them. Always, 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 always. So because of that, you always want to use a median for those. But if the data is nice and well-behaved like this, like, for instance, people's heights, people's weights, things like this that are always going to be, they're going to follow a curve. If you were to look at a histogram of people, people's heights, you would see it looks like this. What? It's a bell curve. That's right. We call this a symmetric distribution. And for right now, when you get to statistics, we'll talk about how this is really called. And this particular one is a normal distribution. Why? Because, well, that's normal. That's what normal things are. You will see a ton of people who are between here and here, height-wise. Yeah, that's right. No one will ever go home and go, you'll never guess what I saw today, honey. Oh, oh, this ought to be good. Tell me. I saw a girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. She was 5'6". Huh? That's it. No, she's 5'6". You see that every day, okay? Now, if you come home and you say, listen, I saw this guy today. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. I'm like, okay, tell me more. He was seven foot eight. Okay, now that's something to talk about, okay? Because that's like off the charts weird out here, off to the side. Weird, okay? I saw, um, I didn't see this guy, but someone told me there was this guy who was four foot 11. I didn't see him as I walked right by him and looked right over his head or something. That would be weird. That would stand out from a crowd, okay? But there aren't very many on the low end or on the tall end, Okay. Everything else is in this middle region. And when I have a situation like this where it's symmetric data, and again, specifically this one is a normal distribution, I would prefer to use the mean whenever possible, the average, okay? So that's just something to take with you when you go to statistics uh, later on. Again, I like to introduce it at this time frame. I just think it fits nicely here. Now, the average or the middle is not the end all and be all, okay? So this data set here, and I'm making this one purposely, boringly easy, okay? And this data set here, have the same median, they have the same mean, but they're not the same, clearly, right? So there's more to it than where is the middle, okay? There's more to it than that, okay? It's how spread out the data is, is something else I'd like to know. How spread out, or if you prefer, how variable is the data? And what I mean by that is this, uh, and this guy up here, man, you're all over the map. Okay, the average is 30, but you're from all the way from 10 to 50. That's crazy. Versus the bottom one, man, everything is really tightly packed around 30. I would be shocked if I saw something like 35 pop out of this guy because that's weird. Everything that I've seen so far 
has been really tightly packed at 30. It's not very spread out at all. Okay, now you've seen this in your daily life before, um, perhaps. Uh, I used to teach with this one guy. We taught the same class. I don't know, he's probably the easiest guy I've ever taught with in terms of you. If you could put up with his, the way he taught, and he was very nitpicky about things like answer keys and answer sheets and I don't know, everything else like that. It was easy A, okay? Um, and everybody in his class, whenever he did a test, they were always tightly packed like this, okay? And his average would be whatever it is. He'd go, oh, I got this average on my test. And he'd look over his data. And man, it was always really tightly packed. And I'm like, oh, that's almost exactly the same average as I got, Bob. But I got kids that got over 100% because they did all the extra credit and it was like, it was a hard test and they still nailed it. And I got other kids that got like a 5%, okay? My data was spread out all over the map. The average was about the same. But to say that those two were the exact same set of data, not even close, okay? Uh, I'll never forget there was a class. I had two classes in statistics one year at the high school. And for years, I always say, hey, fill out this thing when you come in. You're like, how tall are you? Whatever, how... I always asked how old they were and how old their moms were for another activity I did. But I always got some really fancy, easy data. Okay. And so this one, this one year, I collect, when I did them, this one class, everybody's height was like this. And it was just tightly packed. Okay. The average, I forget the average height in the class was probably like five, seven or eight. That's boys and girls all together, maybe five, eight. Yeah, probably five, eight. And, um, and, for, the, for, the, and for both classes, it was five foot eight. But in the one class, everybody was tightly packed. There was no tall kids. There was no short kids. Everybody was completely average height. There was no, nobody was tall, even kind of tall. In the other class, there were four or five boys that were taller than me. So six, four, six, five, six, seven, six, eight. And then there was a girl who would look me right in the eyes, six, three. And I thought, okay, that's kind of odd on that end. On the other end, there was like three girls that were sub five foot tall. And then there was a boy who was five feet tall, right on the money. And when we averaged those two classes, they had the exact same average. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it really illustrates the point that when you make these two data sets, geez, they look the same, but they're completely different because this one is way more spread out. And so we statisticians use a tool um, and it's what's called the standard deviation and what it's trying to do is it's trying to get an eyeball on how spread out or how variable the data is okay and so to find this uh, and again we will only find the sample version of this okay so the sample standard deviation okay is the one that we're going to actually compute there's also what's called a population standard deviation we will not be computing this we will be taking this guy and making a statement about this because I can never know this. There's no way I can find that because I'd have to actually measure and compute for everybody in the population. And that's just not going to be possible. Okay. By the time I get done measuring everybody, some people will have died. Now the other people that have been born or you know have become, you know, maybe you kind of measure the heights of adult women. Well, you know, an adulthood, let's say, starts at 18. Well, by the time you get done measuring everybody, some people will have died. So I have to cut those out. And then other people will become 18, so I'll have to go back and measure those, and it, it, you'll never get it done, okay? So you'll take a sample, you'll do, the, you'll do the, the, the calculations based on the sample, and then you'll make a statement about this guy. Again, this, this population standard deviation can never be known, but this will make a statement about it. We'll say it's most likely somewhere around this neighborhood, okay? And so the way we go about doing this, um, oh, that's the other thing I was going to write, sorry. So we normally write that as just an S. Uh, I usually use an S and then a little sub X for my, my sample standard deviations. I do that so I realize that I, it doesn't look like a five. When I don't try very hard, my S's and my fives look very similar, but I never put a little X by my fives. So that's how I tell mine apart, okay? Um, the population standard deviation is this guy here, which is lowercase sigma. He's the lowercase version of the capital sigma we saw a minute ago with summations. Um, if you're in practice at home, just start with your pencil and just kind of do this number. But again, we're not going to calculate this guy. We're just going to make a statement about him. Okay. So the way that we go about doing this, we'll find the SX. All right. And the formula, I'm going to write the formula down. 
Ooh, I'm going to add up something. That's right. What am I going to add? I'm going to take each of the axes and I'm going to subtract the mean from each of them. By doing that, what are you doing? You are finding the distance that that number is from the mean. Now, it's important at this point here, when I take, for instance, up here, the average right here is 30, right? So if I take 10 minus 30, I'm going to get negative 20. It's important that I take the number minus this guy because that tells me the negative says, hey, I'm below the average. And if I take 50 minus 30, I'm still going to get 20, but it's positive 20, meaning that that number is above the average. Okay. Uh, the difference here is that will come into play, not in this class, but in statistics later on, that same process will come into play again. So make sure that you learn that concept, always the number minus the average. Okay. Now, here's the thing, we're gonna square that, okay? If you don't square it, I'm gonna show you in a minute what happens if you don't square it. But when you square the numbers, every number squared becomes positive, okay? So that's a big deal. And then I'm gonna divide out by, now if I divide it by just N, you would say to yourself, geez, that's like the average, the average, squared distance because that's what this is this is a distance and this is a squared so a squared distance from the mean and you would be right in saying that in essence you'd be finding the average squared distance from the mean and that's true however based on uh, because of things that are beyond the scope of this class and you wouldn't actually learn them until you get to like stats 400 level stats class Instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus one. In other words, one less than the number of terms there are. There's a very good reason for that, but it, you, it takes a lot of high level mathematics to explain that. Suffice it to say, this does a better job of describing what's actually happening with good old sigma over here. It does a better job if you divide by n minus one than if you divide by n. And so watch me do this. <laughs> it's the average squared distance from the mean. The process is the same. But instead of dividing by n, we divide by one less than n, okay? And this right here, sorry, this right here, we, nobody wanted this, the squared distance from the mean. We wanted the, the actual distance from the mean. So the last thing we'll do is we will square root it, okay? This is referred to as the sample standard deviation. And that's how we'll go about computing it. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show you this real quick with the numbers that I had above. I'm going to do it by hand. It doesn't take very long. And no, I would never ask you to do more than five numbers or six, maybe, by hand. Okay, obviously Excel and pretty much every other program on the planet can find this number. I want you to understand what it means. You're trying to tell me how spread out my data is. That's all I'm trying to find out. So I'm going to take 10 minus 30 plus 20 minus 30, plus 30 minus 30, plus 40 minus 30, plus 50 minus 30, negative 20, negative 10, 0, 10, 20, oops, it's a plus. When you add those up, you will always get zero, always. Because when you subtract the average, it's like that teeter-totter picture I drew earlier, it's where the thing balances. So there'll be equal amounts on both sides. It will always add to zero. That is not helpful. So I need a way to make these negative ones positive. So the way we're gonna do that is square them. Someone might say, well, could you take the absolute value? You can, but it doesn't work as well, and it's not as good in higher level statistics to do that. It doesn't accurately represent what goes on in the real world. So we square things, and it actually works better. So this is negative 20. I don't know why you erase that. Squared, negative 10 squared, 0 squared, 10 squared, 20 squared. This is 400 plus 100 plus 0 plus 100 plus 400, this is 1,000. Okay. Divide by, there's five of them, so I'm gonna divide by four, that's one less, and then I'm gonna square root my answer. So it's the square root of 250, which is 
15.8 is my sample standard deviation from right here. You're like, I don't really know what that means, Jay. It, again, we're trying to get an average distance from the mean, okay? Uh, approximately an average distance, okay? Well, if you come back up here, we're, this one's 10 away, or 20 away, this one's 10 away, this one's 10 away, this one's 20 away. You got those values, you're like, I get a 10 and a 10 and a 20 and a 20. I feel like it should be 15. Okay, again, it would be 15, all right? Had we divided, by, it would have been closer to 15 had we divided, again, but we're squaring things. When you square them, and then you divide by one less, it's gonna put it off a little bit. Is it still right in that 15 ballpark? It is. Now, this one here is a better, the, the reason I wanna do these two side by side is because I want you to see that the 15.8, it kinda means something to me, but it doesn't mean as much to me as it does for comparisons, okay? So on this one, you're gonna have 28 minus 30. The number itself, in other words, isn't as big a deal as, um, it's not as big a deal at this point in our careers as it is comparing this number versus another number. So mine's bigger than yours kind of a thing. That's what's more important as opposed to just the actual, I got a 16, it doesn't really mean much. Okay. Uh, but the fact that this one's going to be very small in a second, like 1.5 or something, uh, is a lot different than 15 point whatever. Okay. So that's uh, four plus one is five, plus one plus five is 10. 10 divided by four. So next time we have the square root of 2.5 instead of the square root of 250. And it should be 1.58, okay? So when you compare these two things, you say, listen, I have this data set. It's got an average of 30. It's got a median of 30. That right there tells me, since they're the same, it tells me that this thing is symmetric. I have the same on both sides of the mean, okay? And it has a standard deviation of 1.58. This is very small. This tells me, without even seeing all the rest of the data, that this data is tightly packed together. Versus up here, you go, listen, I've got an average of 30. I've got a median of 30. Well, that's cool. What does that tell me? Symmetric data, because they're right there together. And I've got a standard deviation of 15.5, 15.8. Holy cow, that's big. And so what does that tell me? It tells me that my data is quite spread out. Okay. And when I compare this data set versus this data set, because of this number, wow, that's really spread out versus this guy here. Okay. Now, Again, if all I told you was this, and all I told you was this, I didn't tell you how many numbers are in my data set, but I did tell you because the median and the mean are the same, that number one, it's symmetric, and then number two, that 15.8 tells me that this data is really spread out versus the 1.58 tells me it's really tightly packed together. And that's what we use those for. And we will use those a ton in stats 243. So I want you in 244 both. So for those of you that are going on, I want you to have seen it once before you get there. Right, I want you to feel comfortable with it. Uh, for the rest of us, you know, if you've never taken another stats class in your life, uh, just remember that you will hear things like median frequently in news reports. Um, that's something that happens all the time. And just know, why are they using median versus mean? That's something I want you to take away from my class, okay? Standard deviation for the, for the average Joe on the street, not a big deal, okay? Uh, I could go my whole life without ever knowing standard deviation had I done any number of jobs I've done in my life, you know, when I was farming or other things. Well, farming, yeah, well, yeah. let's be honest. Before I did my stats degree, um, you know, I've heard of standard deviation, of course, I guess. But if I had just gone to fight out of farming right out of college, or if I had gone like into the army and then come back and farmed, I, I wouldn't have known about it. And I would have been probably just as fine, you know. So just be aware of that. It's it's one of those things that, you know, you'll hear about it once in a while and you're like, oh, I wonder what that is. Well, my idea is that you, you walk away from me, you're trying to get an average distance from the mean. That's what you're trying to find, okay? That's, that's about as much as I want to do with those guys. Questions on the gist of that? It's, again, not very hard and I will not make you do more than, oh, I don't know, five or six numbers ever by hand. I just won't do that. That's just, it's rude, okay? I remember back in the dark ages in the like 90, probably went to my first stats class, they would give us like 40 numbers and say, all right, do all that by hand. Oh, oh, oh. 
horrible. Well, I mean, you have to use a calculator. But a calculator with no memory and you do a this plus if you make a mistake somewhere, you go, oh, let's try it again. Awesome. It was not fun. I'm not really sure why I like statistics. But based on that first experience. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about today is the concept of percentiles. And so this is a very straightforward concept that people try to make hard and it's not, okay? So in percentiles, it is the percentage of the population worse than you. That's all it means. That's literally all it means. And I'm gonna put worse than you. You can put lower in there, but that isn't always true. Because for instance, you are the one of the you are in the 95th percentile of uh times finishing a race uh like you know let's any race the 5k or something that means you're pretty fast good for you well then well they're lower than you well not really they had a higher score they had a higher time than you did you know what i'm saying so it's a little weird okay but let's just say worse than you all right if you're uh at the 70th percentile for reading comprehension on some test back in the day 70% of the people did worse than you. If you prefer, you're in the upper 30%, but we always say the percent that's less than you, okay? That's what it's all about. So the way I like to do this is I start off with something that you know a little something about. So back in, I don't know, fifth grade, as I say, Mrs. So-and-so taught you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mrs. So-and-so taught you how to do, uh, I'm sorry, I should be a 90. Uh, taught you how to do a the median, right? And she said, find the middle one, there you go. Well, the median has a name, actually. It is the 50th percentile. Always 50% will be below the median. That's why it's in the middle, okay? So when we do this, it's kind of an easy deal to do. So the formula is very straightforward for this, okay? We're gonna take 0.5, because 50%, and we're gonna multiply by the number of terms here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so times n, which in this case is seven. There are seven terms, okay? And so I get three and a half. In other words, what this is saying is I need to take the three and a half term. Well, there's no such thing as a three and a half term. There's the first term, the second term, the third term, the fourth term, Mrs. So-and-so said that it's the fourth term and she was right, okay? And so what, is she, what are we gonna do here? Well, the idea is this, if this number, so that is 0.5 times N equals whatever it is, if this number is a decimal, round, always round up, okay? So the three and a half term will round up to the fourth term. That guy right there corresponds to the 50th percentile. That, it's as easy as pie, man. Now, what would happen if you had the exact same data set, but we're gonna add one more to the top end of it. Okay. Well, where would the median be now? Well, remember back in the day, you count to the middle, it'd be the average of those guys, yes? So this is the fourth term, this is the fifth term, and you're gonna average them, correct? Well, that's what we were taught in third grade. Well, what would our formula say? Well, we'd say 0.5 times eight. It comes out to be the fourth term. Well, now you're like, well, now that's not what she told us back in the day. She said to take the fourth term and the fifth term. And she, by the way, she was right. So the idea is this, if you take 0.5 times N and it comes out to be a whole number. So if this equals, if this is a whole number, so like four, then average that term, that is the fourth term and the next term. Now, by the way, if all I wanted to do was find the median, I wouldn't be doing this because I already know how to find the median. 
we're going to take this to the next level. Okay. And so it turns out that this is true for any percentile. So if you take the percentile that you're interested in, so here's the percentile that I'm interested in, times n equals the term. It is always true. If it's a whole number, you will average that term and the next one. If it's a decimal, you will always round up. And it doesn't matter what percentile it is, I start with the median because I know what the answer is supposed to be. So for instance, let's say you want the 30th percentile of this data set right here. So 0 0.3 times eight is 2.4. Hey, that's a decimal. I'm gonna round up to the third term. One, two, three. This guy right here is the 30th percentile. It is that easy. Okay. What if you wanted the 90th percentile? I don't know, that's a good question. Let's find out. The 90th percentile would be the 7.2th term, which there is no such thing as a 7.2th term. So I'm going to round up to the eighth term. I can't count too good. No, that's right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait, this guy here is the 90th percentile? Yep, it sure is. But I thought he'd be the 100th percentile. If he was 100 percentile, he'd be the biggest ever. There's no such thing as the 100th percentile because you can never be the best because there's always going to be, there could always be somebody else above you. You could be the 99.9th percentile. You could be a lot of things. You can't be the hundredth percentile, and you can never be the zeroth percentile. That would be also weird. That would be saying you're the worst ever. Doesn't work that way. You can be pretty bad. But you can't be the worst. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Now someone might very well say, "Well, what if I want the ninety-fifth percentile?" I don't know. Let's find out. I can't do that in my head. This is a seven-point-six term. Hey, wait, that also rounds up to the eighth term. You're right, you're right. And just like a lot of things in our lives, sometimes we, or a number, could carry multiple hats, okay? So it could be the 96th percentile, it could be the 90th percent. Did I say 95th? Sorry, 95th percentile. It's all, by the way, it's also the 96th percentile too, okay? Uh, each of these numbers can actually take on more than one percentile, okay? Not a big deal. It's not a big deal. The 50th is the only one that's going to be unique for us. Okay. Um, it's the only one that will always truly be unique. Well, that way they always have true in number. I'll put it that way. It will be the only, it's the only one that'll be the 50th. It will be the median. Okay. Uh, it, it's the only one that it, the median will be the only number that can be the 50th percent. It's the, it'll only ever be the 50th percentile. How about that? Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Good enough. Okay. So I'm gonna get up a new data set here. Now, percentiles are hugely important. If you have a child, you've taken it to the doctor and they measure him, uh, head circumference, height, weight, the whole routine, and they plot that stuff. Okay, there's a reason that they do that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Cool, there they are. If I wanted the 20th percentile of this grouping, I would take 0 0.2 times, did I say 11? I think I said 11. That comes out to be the 2.2th term, which is ridiculous. So that will round up to the third term. One, two, three. This guy right here is the 20th percentile of this data set. What if you wanted the 75th percentile? eight and a quarter, 8.25th term, which of course rounds up to the ninth term. That's this guy. This guy would be the 75th percentile. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. This guy would be the median or the, if you prefer, 50th percentile. If you were a betting person, if you're a person who is like, oh, I like a gamble, I like that. 
Where do you think the 25th percentile would be? Oh, wait, someone chime in. Anybody still awake? Anyone? Ross? Man, anyone? Where would the 25th percentile be? Anyone? Nobody, huh? That's hurtful. Well, I feel like this is two down from the top. And if you think about it, if it's 75% from here down, that kind of means it's 25% from here up, yes? So over here, oh, and wait, there's more. There's more clues. Hey, there's two numbers here. Hey, there's two numbers here. Say from 75 to 50 is 25% here. Hmm. I bet this guy's the 25th percentile. Nice. So the idea here is if you look at it, what have we done? If we have the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile, what have we done to this thing? We've broken it into, if you will, let me just draw them on here. We've cut this guy into how many pieces? Well, there's four pieces here, right? So there's one, one, two, three, four pieces. We've broken it into quarters. Okay. So that's something that we're going to look at in a few minutes. That's probably where we're going to finish the class off talking about um, that part of it. But percentiles is a big deal. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we will, um, you'll see this from time to time. Take your child into the doctor. Percentile. And not just for something goofy like um, like reading percentiles or something. Um, things like this growth chart, it's kind of a big deal. So uh, let's see if I can find one here real quickly. Yeah, here we go. Cool. And so this is for age and months versus length of child. Um, so that's when they're just little kids. It doesn't matter as much. As they get older, then obviously here's for boys from um, 2 to 20 years of age. You can measure them. Um, I used to do this cool assignment where I'd give out a, one for the boys. One, well, it's a front page of boys, back page of girls. I say, go to your grandma's house or your mom, whatever, and, and find your heights over time. And mom would graph them and she'd plot them on. Oh, shoot. She'd plot them on here and she'd make notes as, as time went along and you could trace yourself out. And so clearly, if you are down here nine years old as a dude, if you are about 52 inches tall, you were right on the mid midline, you're right at the median, 50 percentile, okay? If you are, you know, as you come up here, you see that when you get up here at the height, so for instance, 75 inches, you see, I, I, I don't really think of myself as that tall, but you see I'm over the 95th percentile, okay? And so, and on and on and on it goes, okay? Now, uh, they'll track you over time. So they always ask, you know, how old is the mom, how, or how, how old is the mom? How tall is the mom? How tall is the dad, okay? What they're trying to show then is if, if you're looking at this and you're seeing that the kid is always tracking, if they're always tracking uh, off the charts tall wise, there might be an issue there. Okay, I'm gonna snip this out real quick here and bring it over to my, my uh, desktop page. Okay. And uh, the idea there is that the doctor can track what's going on and then hopefully get in front of it if there's an issue, okay? So if your child was plotting like this and like this and like this and like this and like this, but you are 5'11 and your husband's six, you know, 6'6", six, six, the doctor's not going to blink an eye about that. If you are 5'2 and your husband's 5'6 and your kid's doing that, uh, it might be a little weird. But keep in mind that kids grow at different rates. There was a girl I went to high school with. Well, I went to all three schools with her. But in sixth grade, she was freaky, well, freakishly tall. She never grew another inch, and it kind of tapered off like this. And when she graduated from high school, she was like right in there somewhere, okay? It was, it was ridiculous. She never grew another inch, and she was one of the shortest kids in the class. Remember, kids grow at different height frames, okay? Um, but there was a kid in St. Helens years ago. She's, well, my oldest just turned 24, so she's, I think, the same age as him. And she was gra growing like this, like off the charts. And her mom and dad are just average height people. So the doctor's like, this is not right. And like, she never slowed down. 
And so they found out, yeah, she's got some odd disease. And they found it by graphing what was going on. Obviously, if your kid was tracking really low over time, you know, just dropping off the charts, is there a problem with something in the endocrine system or something? Can we track that out? It's kind of a big deal. And so percentiles are a nice way of looking at things. Obviously, if you're shorter, you're gonna be a sh oh, your kids are probably gonna be shorter too. If you're taller, your kids gonna be taller. That's obvious, but they should track accordingly. Okay? And that's what percentiles really help us with. Okay? Now, uh, someone might very well say to you, uh, well, if I scored this, where would I stand? In other words, instead of saying, which of these numbers is the 90th percentile, someone might very well say, well, I scored here relative to this uh, group of people or scores, where do I land? You know, am I in the 60th percentile or the 80th percentile or whatever? And so that's a very easy formula. What percentile is this number? How to figure that out is pretty straightforward. If you remember, the whole thing about a percentile is, is it's the number of scores that are below you. That's what it all means. It's the percentage of scores below you. Well, percent's easy. It's always a number. It's just a number. So just, I don't know, some random number divided by N. All right. That's how you find percentages. Yes. And then times it by 100% because I want a percentage. There's only one problem with that. If you scored a 70, what percent are below you? Ooh, nobody's below me. And I said, there cannot be any zero percentile. So the way we get around that is we take the number of numbers less than, and then we're gonna add 0.5 to that. Okay, always 0.5. And the reason for that is because that gets rid of us having to have a zero percentile. We can't have it, okay? And so it, that will fix that issue for us. So, for instance, if I wanted to know, 70s boring, let's do, uh, let's do this guy, 210. If this is what you scored, how many numbers are less than him? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. So six point plus a half divided by the total number of scores. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So six and a half divided by eight. Oops, times 100%. almost forgot my times 100%. I usually just do that in my head. the 81, 81st percentile, 81st percentile. And you can round that off if you like. You can write the 81st and a quarter percentile. That's fine. We'll just round it to the nearest percentile for that. So that 210 is going to correspond to the 81st percentile. In other words, he's pretty good. Okay. He is one of the furthest up the line in this situation. All right. Not a very hard concept. And again, this right here, is the formula that you will use. Always the plus a half. And remember, the reason we do that is so that we can't have a zero percentile. Okay. Um, that's really just crunching data. You've got to play with that. Um, the last thing that we're going to talk about today is, is still using percentiles, but it's the idea of a box plot. And you've probably seen this if you're youngish and you grew up in Oregon and you paid attention a little bit in high school, kind of. Um, your junior year, most of you are young enough that when you took the test, you were juniors, but it used to be sophomores back in the day. Um, on the state test, they always put a few questions about a box plot. So somewhere in your math curriculum, it doesn't matter if it's pre-calculus or algebra two or algebra one or pre-algebra or geometry, the test is coming up. Oh crap, let's stop and teach these kids box plots. Why? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. So somebody's Somebody gets paid more than I do. I don't know if they're smarter than me. Somebody gets paid a lot more than I do, said, hey, we want these kids to know about box plots. No, okay, well, that's great. You'll never use them in your daily life. Even in statistics, we basically never use them. The only time they come up, they're very helpful. And from, from my standpoint, the biggest thing that they're useful for is I like to use them to identify outliers. Now, back in the good old, back in the good old days, which were not that good before computers. Instead of doing a histogram, which we can do with a snap of a finger like this now, yes? And a few clicks of the mouse, I can make a histogram. Back in the old days, that was really hard to do. And I mean really hard to do. So instead of seeing, doing a histogram and seeing 
what it looks like. Does it look like this? You know, is my histogram a little more skewed? I don't know. Instead of looking at that kind of a thing, instead of doing it that way, they would make a box plot because it was very straightforward. There's five numbers that you have to worry about for a box plot. That's it, five numbers. And from that standpoint, uh, they're very easy to use and they used to be useful. But in the 21st century, and even I would argue the last 30 or 40, eh, the last 30 years of the 20th century, not very useful at all. But they still are very nice as a way to identify an outlier. And that's the biggest reason that I still teach them. Okay, besides the fact that I have to. Um, so if you had a data set, it's one of those ones that should probably have just died out over the years, but it still is helpful for finding which of these guys is by definition an outlier. Because listen, if you if you are in Portland, it is hard to stand out from a crowd if by your dress. Okay, because Everybody in Portland dress is weird. I mean, it's just, it, yeah. you have to be very weird to stand out in Portland. Okay, look at this data set. This data set is all over the map. For you, for a number to be weird in this data set, I mean, holy cow, 500 would be weird. Okay, but I feel like 125, not that weird. Uh, 15, not that weird. Okay, however, if you had a data set that was a little more, and the big kids would call this homogenous that is basically the same. Whatever. You don't have to be terribly weird to stand out from a crowd on this guy. That guy might be an outlier. Okay. This one, uh, that one might be an outlier. Might be. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, 50, 52 might be an outlier. Okay. But again, why is that? Because these guys here, this is a big standard deviation problem right that is they're really spread out versus here it's a smaller standard deviation and so because the they are bigger and smaller standard deviations the bigger one is there's a lot of weirdos here it's gonna be harder to be an outlier up here versus down here it's gonna be easier to be an outlier now what I said about the standard deviation is 100% accurate however the box and whisker plot is easy all you have to do is find the 50th percentile, percentile, which is the median, yep. You have to find the 25th percentile, yep. And the 75th percentile, that's right. And draw a few lines. There's not much to it, friends. So let's start with the median, that's easy money. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine numbers, one, two, three, four, five. This guy here, my median, boom, right now. Okay, 50% below him, 50% above him. Nice. Let's find the 25th percentile. 0.25 times nine is two and a quarter, I think, but let's just double check ourselves. Two and a quarter. So there is no 2.25th two term. You with me? There is no such thing. So I'm going to round it up to the third term. One, two, three. This guy right here is the 25th percentile. Okay. Now without doing any math, this guy here then has to be the 75th percentile. How do I know that? Well, I know that because it's, it's a, a little thing called symmetry and we love symmetry because if you've seen one, you've seen them all at this point, right? You've seen everything there. What did I just do? Oh, I don't know. You've seen everything there is to see. If 25% on one end and 25% on the other end as well, it has to be a mirror image of one another. I'm trying to save this without having to, oh, screw it, I don't care. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a number line. This is probably the easiest thing you'll ever do in a math class. There we go. We're going to draw a vertical line in at the median. Cool. We're going to draw a vertical line in at the 25th percentile. And we're going to draw a vertical line in at the 75th percentile. And we're going to draw a box around it. There's a box plot, friends. That's all there is to it. This box corresponds to the middle 50% of your data. 
Notice how this 25% here is really compressed versus this 25%. What that would mean is if you were looking at a histogram of this, it would look something like this. That is, it would be kind of a big pile over here because again, 25% of your data is shoved into a very small region, if you will. Okay. So this is a picture of more or less what my histogram would look like if I drew it without drawing it. Notice that it has been pulled out to the left. It's been pulled to the left. And we call this, you can say it's skewed to the left. That is, it's been pulled down that direction. Okay, that's what that means. Okay. Now, what about the other 25% of your data? That's a good question. What about it? What about it? Well, as I said, I'm going to use this thing to identify outliers. And the way that we're going to do it, and this is how this has been taught for years, so you're going to take one and a half, always one and a half, times the width of the box. Well, the width of the box is from 100 down to 50, so it's 100 minus 50. By the way, the book will always teach this as Q3 minus Q1. Where the heck did Q come from, Jay? Third quartile so quartiles meaning 25 percent so the third one would be the 75th percentile and the first quartile would be the 25th percentile okay and so when you do this you get one and a half times 50 which is 70 oops 75 what does that mean what it means is we're going to come out here 75 more units Okay, that puts us at 175. This is where we're gonna put the sign that says, welcome to Freakville, okay? Anyway, in other words, anything below, beyond 175 would be considered an outlier on the upper end. We don't have any numbers that are beyond that, so we're just gonna put a dot over here at our biggest number, and we're gonna connect it with a line. That's it. We're going to do the same thing on the other end. We're going to take 50 and we're going to subtract 75. Well, that puts us at negative 25. And that's where we're also going to put the sign for welcome to Freakville. Welcome to Freakville. Okay. And if anybody is less than negative 25, he would be a freak. Well, we don't have any of those. So we're going to put our number, our dot down here. We're going to draw our line like so. And that, my friends, is a box and whisker plot. Again, you can tell based on this. That's 50% of your oops, that's 50% of your data. This is 50% of your data. This data would look like this if you made a histogram of it. That's what the beauty of it was in the old days before there was a computer. But now we have computers to make our histograms. Eh, not that exciting. But what this does is it gives us a way to identify an outlier. In this case, there aren't any outliers because our data is so wildly spread out, there isn't any of them. Again, you'd have to be so weird. 175, that's way out there based on 120. That's way out there. You really have to stand out from a crowd, like dress in a Santa suit, like wear a Santa bikini as a dude in downtown Portland with, uh, with hiking boots or something. I don't know. And that probably still doesn't even get a, a, so much as a nod, okay? And who knows? It, you really have to stand out from a crowd. Versus if you go to my small town America, you don't have to dress very weird at all to stand out from a crowd, okay? You have this data set. Okay. 59 doesn't look that weird. And yet this data is very homogenous. It's very much basically just all in the 30s. So because of this, this guy is likely going to be an outlier. But we're going to see. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. This one is our median, so our 50th percentile. Okay. Our 25th percentile. Did I do nine again? I'm sorry, I did nine again. Oh, well. 2.25. Let's just add one more for fun, shall we? Let's just add another 40. That won't hurt anybody's feelings, will it? It is, I guess you'll get over it. 
we're gonna add another 40. So now there's 10 terms here, are you with me? All right, cool. So the median, of course, you take the middle two, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Right here, 36 and a half would be our median or our 50th percentile. Our 25th percentile would be 0.25 times 10, which is 2.5, which of course rounds up to the third term. One, two, three. The 25th percentile, or if you prefer, quartile one. Uh, by symmetry, that means this guy here is the quartile three, or if you prefer, the 75th percentile. Man, that's all there is to it. So because the data is this way, I'm going to go by ones, I guess. Well, that was dumb. I'm going to count by twos. I'm going to run out of room before I get to 59. That's the only reason. Sorry. Didn't think about that. That's what, that's what uh, outliers mean, Jay. Pay attention. Cool. There we go. Okay. So 36 and a half is right here-ish. Make a vertical line. Uh, 32 is right here. 40 is right here. If you look at that box, what do you see? Well, it's almost identical distances on both sides. Are you with me? It's very similar. So our middle 50% is very much, very much nice and symmetric. Okay. Then I'm going to take one and a half times the width of my box, which again is by definition Q3 minus Q1. So it's 40 minus 32. So 1.5 minus or times 40 minus 32, which is 1.5 times 8, which is 12. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over 12 from 40. That puts me right here. This is where the weirdos start. Are you with me? 52. Anything bigger than 52 is going to be an outlier. Dude, I've got one of them. That's right. So what you're going to do is you're going to put a dot right here, but you're not going to connect it. You're going to go back to the next one that's not an outlier, which happens to be 40. So in this particular example, there is no, there's no uh, whisker on this end. That's what they call them, box and whisker plots. There would be no line up here because 40 is the biggest that you have that is not an outlier. Okay. On the other end of things, we're going to subtract 12. So if you subtract 12 from tw uh, 32, it puts you at 20. Well, we don't have any that far down. So we're just going to go to here. Okay. The fact that this guy over here is all by his lonesome, okay, that means this guy is an outlier. Okay. Now, again, what do we do with outliers? Depends. All right. If you're testing a drug that uh, I don't know cures baldness, um, and so it grows hair most of the time, but you've got an outlier or two where the person died, that's an outlier. A terrible outlier and no you can't pretend like that didn't happen that's a lawsuit okay uh if it's a situation where you know uh, why wow, this kid that's in my pre-algebra class seems to be doing really good uh, and, uh hey got put in the wrong class maybe so do something about it fix him okay hey i was measuring all these tomato plants that you know uh, heights and they were like three four five feet and also there's a 20 footer someone who can't read a tape measure that's what it probably boiled down to there's no such thing as a 20 foot tall tomato plant okay or Tomato, the tomatoes themselves, half pound, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, five pound. Well, there's no thing a five pound tomato. Somebody read the scale wrong. Someone forgot to put a decimal on there. Go back and figure out why. But we can't necessarily just throw them out, okay? So just be aware of that. But it's a way to identify them. That's what I use these box plots. That's about the only reason I use them anymore for. Um, and then think about that. Again, this right here, from here to here, is, that's basically 25%. That's 50. I'd be basically 50% of your data. Because there's no whisker, basically 25% are actually on that line. Okay, had the had the had it looked like this, okay, and and let's just pretend that this the outlier wasn't here. Had my box plot looked like this, that that is what a perfectly symmetric graph would look like. In other words, they're the exact same on both sides, and that's what the box plot told us back in the day. Okay, but again, not very hard to do. Always go find your median. First quartile, third quartile, graph them, 
take one and a half times the width of the box, go out here on both ends. That's where the weirdos are. Anything beyond that, just make a point. Don't connect him and connect the next one down that is not a weirdo. Okay. Not much to them uh, that we want on the test. Um, there'll be a question about, a, there'll be one question about a percentile in the test. Um, well, one, what percentile am I? And then one will be, what is the 60th percentile of this data set or something? And then there'll be a problem with like five or six numbers. Hey, what is the mean, median, mode, standard deviation? That's basically the only part of the test that's going to be on there that will be from today. Those like five or six little questions. Okay. Um, questions at all on today's stuff? Yes, there is videos for this in the frequently asked videos folder. Um, so go look. It talks about how to find the standard deviation. There's one about finding percentiles and one for box plots. So if there's any questions, you can refer to those if you need extra help. I'll also be putting this video up later today at some point. Any questions? When is the exam? Next Saturday, 8 a.m., 8 to 11. Jay, when can we expect the uh, review to be posted? In a half an hour or so. And do you want us to do the exam uh, like in Excel and then upload everything from, like put notes in Excel then upload it that way, or how do you want it to be done? So, I don't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about the fact that um, normally I'd hand you a paper copy. So I prefer, I guess, that you do, you, you, it'd be nice if you wrote the answers on a piece of paper and took a picture of that. But yes, I do want you to do all the work in Excel and upload the Excel as well. So, for instance, on the credit card one, it'll say something, you know, you, you, the average daily balance is this. Okay, great. Well, you're off. So I'll go look at your Excel work, see where you made a mistake, give you partial credit for doing that or something, okay? Or how much money did you save refinancing? Oh, you forgot to add the down payment. I take a few points off for that. And so it's easier for me if I can look at the, the answers and go, oh, these are right. Don't fool with it. And then when I get to one that's wrong, I then can go to the Excel as opposed to trying to go to Excel and find all the answers. It's just tricky that way sometimes. But definitely, if you're going to upload the Excel sheet or share the Google sheet, if you use a Google sheet, you can just share it. Other questions? This stuff that you just showed us, this will all be done on paper. Yeah? Yeah. As opposed to on Excel. Correct. No, oh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, all I want you to do on this part of it is is learning how to do it. So uh, learning what it means and how to do it. So yeah, clearly Excel can do percentiles. It can do percentile rank. It can do standard deviation. It can do all of that. But doing that doesn't really tell me. It doesn't help you understand what it is. It just give you a number. Uh, also, percentiles and percentile ranks. Excel uses a slightly different recipe to compute them. So I always say, you know, if you go online, look for a recipe for lemon meringue pie, which sounds really good right now. I could make one of those. Um, there are millions of recipes out there. When you're done, you get a lemon meringue pie. Okay. So the reason, the way Excel does it is um, often optimized for a computer and it's off and it's a little bit better, but remember a computer is a lot faster than you are. So um, the percentile rank equation that I give you uh, doesn't account for, it doesn't account for, it is the easiest way to do it, in other words. And once you get an understanding of it, then yeah, you just use the one in Excel if you were like in practice doing it. But for the test, I want you to do my hands. Other questions, comments? So yeah, I'll go find that review right now. I don't know why it didn't copy over. It was up last term. I had it up last term, but I'm not sure where it is. So I'll go find it and get it pasted up. Okay, last one, Jay. Has the homework Dropbox been posted yet? I can't remember. I'll get that up too. If it isn't. Okay, thanks. All righty. Well, you guys have a good day. And we'll see you. Email me if you have any questions. Thanks.